Now the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome everyone to the Wednesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch along with Jim Garrity of National Review, also author of The Weed Agency. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. We've got good, bad, and crazy martinis for you as usual. And Jim, we've talked about this from time to time, but uh, right now some of the most respected prognosticators on the political scene seem to think that the goal of Republicans winning back the control of the Senate in this year's midterm elections are looking better than ever. We should leave it with the caveat that we didn't quite get there in 2010, and we also thought Republicans were going to get the majority in 2012 and end up giving back two seats. But right now, uh, as you report at the top of the morning jolt today, Stu Rothenberg believes that six seats being picked up by the Republicans seems very possible. Over at 538, uh, Nate Silver and his gang say that the Democratic majority is in peril. Uh, the number crunchers at the Washington Post say it's an 86 percent chance Republicans could win back the majority of the Senate, although the Washington Post piece that goes along with that result says here's why it could be wrong. But, Jim, either way, uh, you got to like these odds. You can't ask for much better odds. It's starting to come together, which is not to say it's a done deal. You know, a couple months between now and Election Day. And, you know, if you've been watching politics for a while, you know, Republicans find ways for things to go wrong. But when I wrote about this last week, I said, look, it's looking pretty good, but it's kind of hard to tell because there hadn't been a lot of polling in June and early July. You know, midsummer people, you know, pollsters may think that people kind of lose interest in it. Well, this morning, we've had a bunch of interesting polls come out, uh, one from NBC News Marist showing that in Iowa, between Joni Ernst and Democrat Bruce Bailey, they see a, uh, a, a tie, 43 percent each, and that's among registered voters. Usually, Republicans do a little bit better once you put on a likely voter filter. Now, the pollsters might say, well, it's a little early in the year. To put on a filter, it's hard to tell who's going to vote and who isn't. It. It's not that early. <laughs> Come on, guys. <laughs> So we'll see if that gets any better. Then Quinnipiac has uh, Democrat uh, Governor John. This is a governor's race, but still kind of interesting. Hickenlooper, who we know signed those gun control laws, is uh, trailing by one to Bob Bo Beaupre, the Republican challenger. Kind of interesting. And then there's a Democratic firm in Michigan that has the Democrat Gary Peters up by about two and a half percent over the Republican Terry Lynn Land. So, you know, obviously you prefer to have your candidate ahead, but trailing by three is not a bad place for a Republican to be going heading into, you know, mid to late summer. So uh, pieces are coming together, obviously not done yet, but you know, it's doable. And now Republicans, I'd say if you're a Republican activist, campaign worker, volunteer, you know, go, go all out because, you know, look, the opportunity is there and uh, you don't want to leave anything and say, oh, if only we had done X or Y, we might have been able to win the Senate. Yeah. And in some of these races, the money war is, is looking very well for Republicans as well. Tom Cotton doing much better than Mark Pryor. And you mentioned Michigan. Uh, Terry Lynn Land a little bit behind in the polls, but pretty much within the margin of error, uh, doing much better than Gary Peters in the fundraising game. All right. On to uh, the bad martini, courtesy of Jim and the campaign spot. Uh, just yesterday in the bad martini, Jim, we were talking about how due to sequestration, the Pentagon had no choice but to uh, lay off uh, thousands and thousands of military personnel, some who are still on active duty in Afghanistan, thousands of officers. And as you report today, there might be a better way to save some of that money. The Independent Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction is warning Pentagon leadership that the Afghan Air Force doesn't need all the C-130 transport planes provided by the U.S. in a $100 million-plus deal, and it's urging the Pentagon to halt the delivery of another one Without a detailed policy of the review here, the report states that not delivering a single C-130 could save the U.S. taxpayer up to $40.5 million. So not sure why the Afghans can't use this, but uh, if they can't, they're not going to. Uh, there might be better ways to cut here. After writing the weed agency, I was like, you know, I really got to do more to expose these kind of examples, kind of let people know that this is depressingly widespread uh, how often do you find these examples of this? And look, I mean, look, we, we all know that the circumstances in Afghanistan don't look great. We have very good reason to be wary about their ability to go effectively govern themselves after our departure. Karzai appears to have gone, Karzai appears to have gone off the deep end. And you got to wonder, all, we spend, you know, billions upon billions of dollars trying to build a uh, stable, self-sufficient state to, to run itself after we leave, and it's not looking that great. Well, Here's the Afghan Air Force that already has two C-130s. Apparently they're using, it says they're using it 48% of the time, which to me suggests that they're using one, almost not at all, and one, not nearly as often as they could, should. Lots of questions about whether they can properly operate it, maintain it, spare parts, all that kind of stuff. 
Um, and the Inspector General, who has this is not part of the Pentagon, it's basically it's an independent agency that's able to look over USAID, any organization that is involved in spending money in Afghanistan, said, look, this is not a wise expenditure. Um, and I kind of was doing, doing further digging, found out it was the um, acting Deputy Secretary of uh, Defense, uh, a woman named Christine Fox, who, who approved this, uh, even though there are a bunch of people at the Air Force who weren't so sure about this. Ironically, this is a woman who inspired Kelly McGillis's character in Top Gun. Uh, she was only the job for a couple of months. She was an acting position. And um, so now we're spending, you know, $40 million on planes that the Afghans may not use. And you got to wonder, you know, like, what's going to happen to those planes? Are they just going to fall into disrepair on some airfield somewhere? Or heaven forbid, will bad guys get them? There's some serious questions to be asked about this. And, you know, all indications are this plane deal is going to go steaming right ahead. Let's move to the crazy martini now. And... Uh, Long-time listeners of the Three Martini Lunch will know that we've spent some time in the Crazy Martini on former Oregon Congressman David Wu, who's actually the first ever uh, Chinese-American elected to the House. He resigned uh, shortly after the 2010 elections. His behavior is getting increasingly bizarre. Most significantly, he was accused and eventually acknowledged he had a sexual encounter with an 18-year-old woman. So he did resign in 2011, but he's still on the Hill, which is not completely rare for ex-members to be on the Hill. But uh, according to this article from BuzzFeed, He's still handing out business cards that look eerily similar to a current uh, member of the House of Representatives, and he doesn't seem to have any sense of shame that led to his uh, resignation. So a guy that uh, we've pretty much uh, figured out has got some issues uh, clearly hasn't dealt with a lot of them yet, Jim. Oh, I think we underestimated him, Greg. You know why he's still sticking around on Capitol Hill, Greg? Because he has the eye of the tiger. He also has the tiger suit that he liked to wear and uh, send pictures of himself in with his staffers and looking like a guy who has gone off his rocker. So um, kind of a sad undercurrent to this, but I guess we can feel a little, little reassured that he's at least no longer voting on major pieces of legislation and maybe some other friends of the Democratic side of the aisle can stage an intervention and say, hey, David, it's time to move on with your life and, and find something else to do. And uh Get out of the tiger suit. <laughs> it's a jungle out there, I tell you. <laughs> Very good. Anytime you can get Eye of the Tiger into the three martini lunch, it's worth it. Although we do hope David Wu gets some help uh, now that yeah. he's Yeah, well, it was either that or Katy Perry's Roar. <laughs> yes, if we were looking to uh, attract the millennials, we would have gone with uh, with Roar. But uh, And we want them to. But uh, next time, I'm sure he's not done yet. So next time, next time we'll bust out Roar. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> have a great day. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. And be sure to join us again on Thursday for the next Three Martini Lunch.